if you would, please open up your Bibles with me to the book of Romans, Romans chapter 8. As you have probably caught wind of, I'm sure you have, but we've been going through Mark 1, verse by verse for the past few months. Uh, but as we come here at Christmas and uh, to the end of the year, there's, there's a couple of texts that I would like to highlight uh, over the next couple of weeks. This is one of them, and then next week, of course, I'm going to uh, preach a, a sermon on... Uh, the Christmas story, the essence of the, the Christmas story, as, as the world contemplates and considers the coming of the Son of God, uh, and even as sinners mark out that season, um, I found it to be fitting to speak on the incarnation of the Son of God, how Christ came, and perhaps to preach on the nativity story and the doctrine there that is brought forth in that narrative. But I'd like to go to Romans uh, t today, this morning, in Romans chapter 8, and I want to cover the entirety of this chapter, the entirety of the chapter of Romans 8, and want to consider the truths that are put forth in this chapter. I, well, I didn't want to finish the year out and not, and, and not, look at, not having looked at this chapter. There's so much here. I think it would be a blessing to each of us if we would consider, even just um, though it would be brief, a lot of what's put forth here in this entire chapter of Romans 8, which speaks um, to the benefits that a child of God has in Christ, the benefits that they experience being Christian. So typically I'd read the text, but this is quite a long chapter, so I won't do so. Instead, we're going to pray and ask that God would bless the preaching of His Word before we go through this text together. Father, I just pray that as I stand before Your people to make Your Word known, that You would give me much strength, clarity, simplicity, that You give me grace, Father. I pray for those who hear, that believers would be built up, encouraged, Father. I pray for Your people to be encouraged by Your Word. I pray for souls to be saved. And I pray that Christ Himself would be glorified. I, I, I pray for these things. I pray that the kingdom of the Lord Jesus Christ would be expanded. We know that one of the means that He has ordained is the preaching of His own Word to expand and to grow, to strengthen, to bless His kingdom. So I pray that that would take place this day. And I pray all these things in His name. Amen. Amen. The title of this sermon is The Benefits of Justification. The Benefits of Justification. When we think about salvation, when we think about a child of God being reconciled, or a sinner being reconciled to God, therefore becoming a child of God, what all comes to mind when we think about the benefits that they experience? Oftentimes, I myself highlight just two, typically. Forgiveness of sin and the righteousness of Christ given to them. And those are all true, and that's how they're justified. It's because they're sin to forgiven, and they've been given the righteousness of Christ. But there is so much more afterwards that they experience. There are so many realities that they take part in, having now been justified. Because they are now in Christ, because they are now in the kingdom of God, they take place in so many wonderful truths. The Spirit of God is in them. They have an eternal inheritance in Christ. They are in Christ forever and nothing can snatch them away from His hand. And these are some of the truths I want to make known this morning. That for you, brethren, each of you individually... If you truly know Christ, all of the benefits that Paul references in this chapter are yours. Why? Because you and I feel them to be so. No. But because God Himself has declared it to be so. God here through the Apostle says these are the benefits that my people experience. They live in. It is the air that they breathe. The Christian swims in blessing. In fact, Paul uses the term riches of grace in Ephesians. That we have taken part in God's riches of grace. 
We may be poor in this world, but we have been made rich in divine blessing from God. For we are no longer under God's wrath, but we are in His grace and His love. His love is now shed abroad in our hearts. And so we are now children of God. So many benefits are at our disposal. And we need to remember that. We need to recall that. We need to stand upon that by faith. By faith. Before we go to this text, of course, the context of this passage in Romans 8. Paul is already, at this point in the book of Romans, he has already covered the issue of salvation very thoroughly. Chapter 3, chapter 4, chapter 5, chapter 6, he talks about our relation to sin now that we're dead to it. Chapter 7, he talks about the believer being united to Christ and also the struggle that he himself had as a believer against the flesh. That, they're, they're, that the Christian struggles. In fact, he says in the end of Romans 7, verse 21, he says, I find then the principle and evil is present in me, the one who wants to do good. For I joyfully concur with the law of God in the inner man. But I see a different law in the members of my body waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner of the law of sin which is in my members. Wretched man that I am, who will set me free from the body of this death? Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then on the one hand I myself with my mind am serving the law of God, but on the other with my flesh the law of sin. So he says, I, I, I'm having this struggle as a believer, and who's going to set me free? How am I going to be free from this? I'm a wretched man. Paul says that. Thanks be to God, through Jesus Christ our Lord. His confidence is in Christ alone. That God had great benefits for Paul to experience in his son. And that ought to be the hope of every believer. So let's consider some of those benefits. Those benefits of justification as we move into chapter 8. Beginning in verse 1. Paul says this. Now I have to understand, the chapter, the chapter breaks and the verse breaks even were added on later. The original manuscripts and the original Greek, this isn't there. These, these chapter breaks aren't there. So immediately, what does he say? Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. So he says, I'm struggling. I've got a struggle going on with sin. But what? There is absolutely no condemnation. That's why he can say in verse 25 of chapter 7, Thanks be to God. Thanks be to God. Because he knew what he was about to say in chapter 8. That there was no condemnation. That ought to be the cry of our hearts. Thanks be to God that we ourselves, as believers, do not experience condemnation. Why? Because we are in Christ. We are in Christ Jesus. We once were under the wrath of God, but now we are under His grace. Why? Because we are in Christ Jesus. And this is a, a concept that, for me at least, when I was a believer, especially in my earlier days as a believer specifically, I struggled with. Because I couldn't understand exactly what Scripture meant when it said, you are in Christ. What does it mean to be in Christ? Simply put, it just means to be saved by Christ. To be a believer in Christ. To be wrapped in the righteousness of Christ. To have one's sins atoned by Christ. It's not as if you somehow step into a bubble and you're in that bubble. This is not a physical reality. This is spiritual truth. To be in Christ is very simple. It just means to be a follower of Jesus. Sometimes what will happen is we want to ultra-spiritualize things and make things esoteric. Esoteric. 
make things watery, or I should say murky, not able to look through, not able to see, unclear. When Scripture's clear, to be in Christ simply means to be a believer in Christ. It's just a short way of saying it. It, it means to be in the sight of God regarded as having lived Christ's life, as we looked at this morning in Sunday school just earlier on. <clears throat> to be regarded by God as having performed sufficiently as Jesus himself performed. That's what it means to be in Christ. And before we go any further, I just want to say, if you are not in Christ... You need to be in Christ. You need to repent and to believe the gospel. So that you yourself will be in the sight of God, in Christ, regarded as having lived Christ's life, having your sins taken away by Christ. So that the benefits that I will speak about in a few moments will be yours. I plead with you. Paul continues, verse 2. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and death. Now again, we can, we can make this murky and unclear and try to add extra meaning to it. What's the law of the Spirit of life? It simply means that we are under a new law. We're, not, we're no longer under the law of sin and of death. We're now ruled by what? The Holy Spirit. And we have new life in Christ. That's what we're ruled by. What is a law? It's a rule. It's that which you live according to. We're no longer under the rule and reign and judicial power of sin as it were. We are now under the power of the Spirit. And that's one of the things that we're going to see a lot in this chapter is the third person of the Trinity. The Holy Spirit is referenced a lot in this chapter. And that's because when we think about salvation, specifically the life of the believer, sanctification is, is sometimes called, our walk of faith, which member of the Trinity is most active in that process? It's the Holy Spirit. You realize that, brethren? The Holy Spirit is the one who enables us to pray. The Holy Spirit is the one who upholds our faith. The Holy Spirit is the one who gives us boldness to share the gospel with the lost. The Holy Spirit is the one who excites the fruit of the Spirit in us, the love, joy, and peace, and patience, etc. The Holy Spirit is the one who brings those things about. The Father has already predestined and sent Christ. Christ has already died in a tomb. Now the Spirit brings that all home, as it were, to our hearts and applies it. So if you are in Christ, you are no longer under the rule, the law of sin and death. What does sin bring about? Death. But what does being under the command of the Spirit of God bring? Life. Both in this life and in the life to come. Eternal life. What does he say in verse 3? For what the law... Now notice, going back to verse 2... He talks about two different laws. The law of the spirit of life and the law of sin and death. But then verse 3, he says, for what the law could not do. Now this is specifically the Ten Commandments. The moral law that God gave in the Old Testament. He says, for what the law could not do, weak as it was through the flesh, God did. Sending His own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh and as an offering for sin, he condemns sin in the flesh. Why is that? What is the weakness of God's law? What is the weakness of the law? It's this. Only, the only thing the law can do is point out sin. It can't save us from it. It can't atone for it. It can't fulfill itself on our behalf. All those things are only accomplished by Christ. So there's a weakness to God's law. In terms of there's a limit to what it can do for us. It does have a purpose. It does. As I've mentioned many times before, it shows us our need for Christ. So the law of God is very important. Paul does not negate that. Very important. In fact, he says at the end of chapter 3 of the same book, he says faith, or the gospel, specifically the gospel of salvation by faith alone, establishes the law of God. It establishes the law of God in its proper place. 
We need to remember the law of God because it reminds us over and over and over and over again our absolute need for Christ. And we need to be reminded because we're prideful. We're prideful. As I said earlier this morning, what is our bent? To go to self-righteousness. To go to works righteousness. So we need to be reminded by the hammer of God's law upon our consciences that we are still sinners. Great sinners. But Christ is a greater Savior. So Paul says the law could not do things. So God comes down. God condescends. He sends His own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh. And as an offering for sin. He condemned sin in the flesh. So what happens? The second person of the Trinity comes down and becomes an offering for sin. And the Father condemns our sin in His flesh. Verse 4, so that the requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. Wow! We now as believers... Now here's something you must understand. When someone is saved, they don't walk away from God's law. They are freed from its condemn, a condemnation, from its condemning power. We, are free from it. we will never be condemned by God's law because Christ has perfectly put away any condemnation for us. As he just said there at the beginning, verse 1, there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. But when someone is saved, they themselves, what do they do? Walk in righteousness. They delight in God. They delight in the truth of God and obeying God and glorifying God. It is their delight to obey God's law. As we know from Psalm 1, the righteous man meditates on the law of the Lord day and night. It is, it is the Christian's joy to obey God out of gratitude. The essence of the Christian ethic, the essence of the Christian ethic is gratitude. It is gratitude. It's being grateful unto God for what He has done. So we walk in obedience to God's law. And notice what Paul says. He says, so that the requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us. Might be fulfilled in us. Paul talks about this in Galatians 5. If you remember, earlier this summer, I went through the fruit of the Spirit. And in Galatians 5, Paul talks about this very point. That the child of God does not need outward commands even to be given unto him because he will walk in obedience to God's law because the Spirit has written it on his heart. And therefore, he will walk in obedience to God's law. He will fulfill it. Not perfectly, surely not. But to a greater and greater extent, more and more and more. It says, who do, not, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. How is it accomplished? The Spirit. Verse 5, for those who are according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh. But those who are according to the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. This is incredible. This is some of the benefits the child of God experiences. So when they were outside of Christ, when they were an unbeliever, what was their mind set on? The things of the flesh. However, now that you, brethren, and me are Christians... Born again, our minds now are attuned to spiritual things. We, we can actually dwell upon spiritual things. In fact, it uses the term set their minds. The one who is a believer, true believer, automatically sets their minds to the things of the Holy Spirit. Automatically. Verse 6, for the mind set on the flesh is death, but the mind set on the spirit is life and peace. Life and peace. This is for us. 
for us. Life, peace. Why? Because our minds are set on the Spirit. Notice the duality. Paul's, Paul's trying to contrast this. You're in the flesh, your mind's set on the flesh. You're in the Spirit, your mind's going to be set on the things of the Spirit. It continues with this duality, this contrasting these two concepts, verse 7, because the mind set on the flesh is hostile toward God. Hostile. And this further reinforces what I said earlier. That there is no neutrality of Christ. There is no middle ground. That when men come out of the womb, for most of the time at least, if they're not regenerate before they come out of the womb, and they're dead in their sin, their minds are hostile to God. And we see that all around, especially in this, in this day and age, where we have secularism, humanism, we have an evolutionary worldview that is taught in schools, higher education, places of higher education, which are otherwise excellent places. Why? Because men's minds are set in hostility against God. The mind set on the flesh is hostile toward God. For it does not subject itself to the law of God. For it is not even able to do so. The, the, the unbeliever can't subject themselves to the law of God. They can't. They can't truly at least. They may can have some sort of pseudo-religion, pseudo-Christianity. But they can't truly set their minds upon spiritual things. It's an impossibility. Because they will not. They will not. And then to further add to this, verse 8, and those who are in the flesh cannot please God. They cannot please God. If you're in the flesh, nothing you do can please God. And that is why you must run to Christ. But listen to what he says in verse 9. However, you are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. Okay, okay, again, the trajectory, the, the, the focus of this chapter is the Christian, the believer. So he says, you're not in the flesh. You're out of the flesh. You're now in the Spirit. And then he says this, if indeed the Spirit of God, is, uh, the Spirit of God dwells in you. So Paul, Paul adds that. If indeed the Spirit of God is in you. But if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he does not belong to him. Now this is interesting. He says the Spirit of God, which is a, a common term we find in Scripture, the Holy Spirit. He also says the Spirit of Christ. That's because the Holy Spirit proceeds not only from the Father, but from the Son. From the Son as well. So he can be, he can be called the Spirit of Christ. If you don't have the Holy Spirit, you do not have Christ, and Christ does not have you. You're an enemy with God. You're at war with God. It's very simple for you to discern whether or not you have the Holy Spirit. It is not whether you speak in tongues or you fall around on the floor and make some ostentatious gesticulation or as if you can see visions. It's quite simple. The fruit of the Spirit, as I referenced earlier, the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. These fruits will tell you whether you have the Spirit of God. In their absence, they will tell you no. In their presence, they will tell you yes. Verse 10, if Christ is in you, Though the body is dead because of sin, how true that is. I'm sure we can all testify to that reality. The decaying nature of this life. In fact, uh, one, of, one of the laws of thermodynamics, the second law of thermodynamics, everything is in a downward spiral. Everything decays. Everything, everything is bent toward decay. Everything is. 
Think about it. Where we look around in this world, wherever we look, everything is, is bent toward chaos. Those of you who are moms can testify to this with children. Everything is bent toward a mess and chaos. They don't, have the they don't have the natural propensity to be neat and clean. They have the natural propensity to be messy. We have to teach them to be clean. Or if you leave the house clean one day, you come, you come back home from running errands, and it's a mess. Everything has that natural propensity to downgrade. And that's what Paul says here. The, the body's dead because of sin. We're in a dying state outwardly. We may even look gloomy. Our faces may even be decaying. But the inward man is being renewed. The inward man is alive. He is thriving. He is feeding upon the bread of life the Lord Jesus Christ. And one day he will put off this body of death. And he will live eternally with Christ. That's ultimately what we look forward to. He says, yet the Spirit is alive because of righteousness. Because they themselves have been declared righteous, regarded as righteous, treated as righteous in the sight of God. Verse 11, but if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you. Here's your promise, brethren. Cling to this. Cling to this is precious. Memorize this. Memorize this text and live upon it and preach it to yourself. We all ought to be preachers. Even women, just not to others, but unto yourselves. We ought to preach to ourselves daily. Daily. We need it. I need it. Desperately. Listen to what it says. He who raised Jesus, or Christ Jesus, from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through His Spirit who dwells in you. When Jesus Christ returns, on that glorious day when the, when the sky is ripped open and Christ appears as the Lord of glory and those who pierced Him will wail and weep. Those who hated Him will fear, but those who loved Him, those who obeyed Him, those who adored Him, those who found their trust and their refuge in Him, they themselves will be raised. Given new bodies. <clears throat> How do I know this? Have I seen it? Have I felt it? No. No. God has said it. God has said it. And it will come to pass. If you struggle with faith, brethren, I'll say this. If you struggle with having Faith in God. I would encourage you to go home, to go home, and to open your Bible and to begin reading in the book of Genesis, chapter 1, all the way to Revelation, if you see that. <coughs> but specifically the Old Testament, all the way to the end of Malachi. And pay attention to the faithfulness of God. Every time God said He would do something, He fulfilled it to the uttermost. It wasn't as if there was just this vague prophecy, just vague fulfillment. It was perfect execution of every promise, every prophecy. We think about Jesus, who Himself fulfilled about 480 prophecies of the Old Testament. Incredible. The promises of God will never fail. They are the pillow upon which we rest our hands. They are this mighty fortress of our refuge in hardship. In the dark night of the soul, we find refuge in the promises of God. Because if God has said it, it does not matter our feelings. It does not matter what we think even. <coughs> we think about Abraham. Who himself was promised by God to have a son, yet he failed. He did not keep the faith. He was inconsistent. 
Because what happened later on? His wife convinced him to commit adultery with her, with another woman, with her, with her handmaiden, Hagar, and to have another child to aid God, to help God fulfill the promise. We know what happened. He wasn't the son of promise. That was the son of the flesh. That was the son of disbelief. We can only imagine how much pain that brought upon Abraham, Abraham's life. But what happened? Did God's promise fail because Abraham failed to believe it sufficiently, to believe it consistently? Absolutely not. Because the promises of God are in themselves there. They're there for us. They're outside of us. They'll be there whether you're here or not. They'll be here whether I'm here or not. They're more firm and more secure than the firmest foundation that man can lay on this earth. And that, that ought to bring us comfort. Just already in these first 11 verses of this chapter, contemplate these promises that are for you, brethren. Apprehend them by faith so that you might take part in them. Verse 12, he continues, So then, brethren, we are under obligation, not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. He brings application here, you might say. He says, okay, in light of these truths, you're under obligation, but you're not under obligation to the flesh. Clearly not. For what does he say? For if you live according to, if you are living according to the flesh, you must die. But if by the Spirit you are putting to death the deeds of the body, you will live. That's another way you can tell. The question is still being asked, well, how do I know I have, if I have the Holy Spirit? Are you putting to death the deeds of the body? Are you putting to death the deeds of the flesh? Are you resisting this world? Are you resisting your fleshly passions and lusts and instead obeying God? And the Spirit's in you, because the Spirit does that. The Spirit enables us to do that. And therefore you will live. Verse 14. For all who are being led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. You're being led by the Spirit. You're a son of God. You're a daughter of God. Verse 17. And if children and heirs also. Or excuse me, I'm sorry. Verse 15. For you have not received the spirit of slavery leading to fear again, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons by which we cry out, Abba, Father. Another benefit that the child of God experiences is access to God in a very unique way. And what I mean by that is this. The child of God doesn't merely have access to God. They have intimate access with God to the extent that they can appear before the Holy One and say, Father, Father. That was incredible. If you told a first century Jewish person that you could address God as Father, they might even consider that blasphemous. Because God is holy. He is a righteous God. He is a, he is a burning, hot Flame. We know from uh, Deuteronomy 4, 24, He is a consuming fire. Yes, He is gracious and compassionate, but He is not. His grace and compassion and mercy are not to be trampled upon. He is to be reverenced and feared. And then the Lord Jesus comes along, certainly with reverence and fear, but nonetheless addresses God as Father. As Father. And so now as children of God, we have the Spirit in us, the Spirit of adoption, who enables us to cry out, See, Christ is the only Son of God in the sense that He's the only begotten. The only one who shares the same essence and nature as the Father. However, every Christian is the child of God in the sense that they've been adopted. They've been engrafted. They've been put in. Christ is the Son of God because He was begotten. We are sons and daughters of God because we've been adopted. That's an important distinction to make. 
Because we don't share the essence of God. We don't share the nature of God. We certainly bear the image of God. God made us in His image. And we have, we have meaning and value and worth because we bear God's image. However, however, we're not little gods. We're not, we don't take part in His nature in that manner. Only that's reserved for the Lord Jesus Christ, who is of the same essence, being and nature as the Father, who is truly God and truly man. Verse 16, the Spirit Himself testifies with our spirit that we are children of God. The Holy Spirit testifies with us that we are God's children. Verse 17, and if children, heirs also, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with Him so that we may also be glorified with Him. There's suffering for the child of God. But there's a coming glory. There's a coming glory where they will be glorified with Christ. So we're going to suffer. We might even suffer for the gospel's sake. Some have already. Many are at this very moment. I've told you this before. America, we're in a bubble. That's not how it is around the world. To be a Christian around the world is much more difficult. It's easy in America. In fact, it really, especially here in the South, it's a benefit to be a Christian, to say you're a Christian. It gives you a reputation, especially in a small town like this, you get a reputation if you say you're a Christian. Especially if you're a good churchgoer, you go to church a lot. In the South, that's a good thing. Especially if you're trying to have a good business in the local area, you want to be known as a churchman. People will trust you. However, it would be interesting to see if going to church means that you will lose your job. Identifying yourself with the name of Jesus Christ means you will lose your life. That would be fitting. And that may be soon happening here in America. Now I want to skip these next few verses due to time constraints. Go down to verse 26 with me. As Paul brings this to a close. He says, in the same way the Spirit also helps our weakness. For we do not know how to pray as we should, but the Spirit Himself intercedes with us, or for us with groanings too deep for words. That's incredible. What, what do we often encounter in prayer? I know I do. I don't know how to pray. I don't know how to pray. And yet, there's really so many things I could pray for, but sometimes you just, you, you, you encounter that. I don't know what to pray for. I'm weak. The Spirit intercedes for us. Intercedes. He stands before God for us. He's praying for us. He's petitioning on our behalf. He gives us groanings to deep for words. And I've experienced that before in prayer where there's an awe of God, there's an awe of the presence of God, there's an awe of the glory of God, and awe of the truth of the Scriptures, the truth of the Gospel, and there is a groaning to deep for words, as it were, a spiritual groaning. You can't put it into words how majestic the God of glory is. Verse 27, And he who searches the hearts knows what the mind of the Spirit is, because he intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. The Spirit prays for us. The Spirit intercedes for us. If you're weak, the Spirit is interceding for you. Brother. Verse 28, This is often put on coffee cups and framed in your house, probably. A wonderful passage. And we know that all, God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to His purpose. I say, I say this a lot, but all things are down to our good and God's glory. Two things, our good and God's glory. How true that is, that everything in this universe, in one way or another, works for the good of God's people. And we think, well, what? People, Christians get killed all the time. That's a good thing. Why? Be it absent from the body, it's present with the Lord. It's better to be away from this life, to be with the Lord. In fact, Paul talks about the struggle of Philippians. He says, oh, I want to be with Christ. I just want to be gone. I want to be away. But he struggled because he's like, for, for, for your sake, oh, Philippians, I, I want to stay. Just to help out others. He really, there's nothing in this life. There's a, this, this life doesn't have much luster to it. I know I haven't lived long, but the, the sin that I have committed in my life 
always leaves me empty. It never delivers on its promises. Sin is a deceiving thing. What does it promise? Do this one thing. Look lustfully at this one person. Say this worldly word. Watch this movie. And it will bring you joy. It will bring you happiness. Does it ever? No. Maybe for a season. Maybe for a few minutes. But unless you're so hard-hearted and so deluded that you can't even see your own depravity, you see that it's worthless. What does it, the writer of Ecclesiastes say? Vanity of vanities. All is vanity. But going back there to verse 28, all things work for the good of God's people. That is a promise. Notice, these are all promises. He doesn't say, okay, if you're a good Christian, God's going to be sure that everything works out for you. He just says, everything will work out for the good of God's people. Verse 29, For those whom He foreknew, we also predestined to become conformed to the image of His Son, so that He would be the firstborn among many brethren. Christ is our elder brother. Our elder brother. That's incredible. God foreknew us. He predestined us. Verse 30, Those whom He foreknew, and those whom He foreknew, He also predestined. And these whom he called, he also justified. And these whom he justified, he also glorified. There's a golden chain of salvation as we looked at in Sunday school earlier. We've been predestined, we've been called, we've been justified, we've been glorified. Verse 31, what then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who is against us? True. He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him over for us all, how will he not also with him freely give us all things? In other words, he's saying, if God gave his own son to die for our sin, would he not give us everything else? Christ is more valuable than everything created, every person, every planet, the entirety of the universe. Christ outweighs them all. And so it's a, it's a less valuable thing. It's a, it's, it's, it's a smaller thing for God to give us all things. Think about that. God's already given us something, someone, who is of more value than anything, all things, anything you can imagine or conceive, put together. So anything else God bestows upon us is, is really of lesser value than Christ himself. Verse 33. Who will bring a charge against God's elect? God is the one who justifies who is the one who condemns? Christ Jesus is he who died, yes, rather, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who also intercedes for us. Who's going to condemn us? Who's going to condemn us to hell? Nobody, because God's justified us. Christ died for us, he was raised for us, he sits, sits at the right hand for us, and he intercedes, <coughs> as Paul says, for us. And then he brings it all to a close. Beautifully, in verse 35. Who will separate us from the love of Christ? The love of the Lord Jesus Christ toward His people is so precious, is so powerful, is so binding, it's so uniting, it's so overcoming. Paul says, who will separate us from the love of Christ? And then he says, will tribulation, will distress, will persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword? Just as it is written, for your sake we are being put to death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. But in all these things we overwhelmingly conquer, conquer through him who loved us. There is always victory for the child of God. Not, maybe not this life. Probably not in this life. According to what we've seen in church history and the Word of God, your life may be hard and you may die 
having been hurt and abused and lonely, that's not your victory. That's not the end. That's the end of all the old things, this old world. And when we pass through the veil, it's instant glory. And then he says, verse, 20, uh, verse 38, I would encourage you to memorize this. This is in contradiction to anyone who would say, oh, you can lose your salvation. Foolishness. Foolishness. Verse 38, for I am convinced that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. What can pluck you away from God's redeeming love? Nothing. Nothing. No one. Some people will say, oh, well, Paul didn't list you. You mean to tell me Paul lists all these things? Saying none of them can separate you from God's love, but you can? That's foolishness. He lists all these things to show that you can make a list of as many things as you want, and nothing on that list can separate the child of God from His love for them. That's Romans 8. That's power. Briefly, I would exhort you, brethren, to learn these truths, to preach them unto your own heart, to grab hold of them by faith, to walk in them, and you will be changed. How do I know this God's truth is transforming? It transforms lives. And as a child of God, we have been transformed. Guess what we're constantly being transformed? On every day, daily, daily, daily. God is conforming us to the image of His Son. How do I know that? He predestined us to it. So it says in the same chapter. He predestined us to be conformed to the image of His Son. That's verse 29. He's going to see it come to pass. And you who know not Christ, I would exhort you, I would plead with you, if you've heard the sweetness of these benefits, to come to Him that you might take of them, or take of them, that you might be in them. And if you say that you know Christ, as Paul clearly says here in this chapter, look at your life, look at, see if the Spirit of God is enabling you to put to death the needs of the body, see if the Spirit is bringing forth the fruit of the Spirit in your life. And if so, then you fit into the category of a believer. But if not, you're outside of Christ. And even if you make claims to religion, it's about inward life. So come and have it in Christ. He, through His Word, calls men. Come, all ye who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest, He says. So we've seen here in Romans 8 the benefits of justification. The benefits that a child of God experiences. I think what's interesting is to think this is just a few, just a handful. This isn't all of it. This isn't all of it. It's just one chapter of one book. And there's 66 of them. And then you think about Paul says that no eye has seen nor ear has heard of the things that God has prepared for those who love Him. All this in Scripture, and Paul says, that's nothing. That's nothing. No eye has seen, no ear has heard what God has prepared for His people in glory. That's incredible. This God is holy. Yes, He's unapproachable. By us, we can't approach Him because of our sin. Because He gave His law. You shall not lie or steal. We broke it. We broke it. We broke it. We trampled it underfoot. And we all deserve hell. But as was spoken of in this chapter, God sent His Son of His love 
Never to the negation of His holiness. Christ came and died, bearing the wrath of God against sin for His people, and was raised on the third day. And for all who repent and come to Him is full forgiveness of sin and His righteousness given to them by grace. All for the glory of God. And they themselves will be the partakers of these precious benefits. All by His grace. And all for His glory. And so I think we can all certainly say to God be the glory for all this. For His Son, for these benefits, for the truth of His Word. Indeed, let's pray. Oh Father, we do ascribe unto You glory, praise and honor. I just pray, I simply pray, Father, that Your Word would accomplish its intended purpose. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.